Well, today I'd like to return to the series that we began in the fall, focused on the greatest sermon ever told, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you were here in the fall, you may recall that I repeatedly said that Jesus is not telling you through the Sermon on the Mount what you need to do in order to enter the kingdom of God. Rather, Jesus is telling you who you become when the presence and power of God come into your life. But let me underscore that it's not just about who you become. Actually, Jesus is telling us who we become all together. It's about how he forms us into a community. You may recall, for example, that Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Well, those yous are plural. So he's not talking about you in the singular, but us all together. And therefore, the Sermon on the Mount is not really a guide for the individual. It's not a guide for how you can enjoy your own private, personal, religious experience. Rather, it's a guide to authentic Christian community. And that's especially true as we turn to Matthew chapter 7. Now, John Stott was a great commentator on the Bible in the 20th century. And in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, at first glance, it's not altogether clear what ties together the disparate paragraphs in Matthew chapter 7. There's no clear progression of thought, or so it seems, until you pan back and you realize that what ties all these paragraphs together is the common thread of relationships. It's all about our relationships with one another, with our Heavenly Father, with the wider world. So from the moment you give your life to Jesus, all of your relationships will change. But that doesn't mean that your relationships will be perfect. No, Jesus expects, he expects that there's going to be problems and there's going to be difficulties within the Christian community as well as without. And that is why it is so easy for us to develop judgmental attitudes. And he couldn't have been more right about that. Christians are supposed to be known for our love for one another. But oftentimes it seems that Christians are best known for being judgmental. But thankfully, Jesus anticipated this. So in the very first verse of chapter 7, Jesus famously says, Judge not that you be not judged. Now Matthew 7 verse 1 might now beat out John 3.16 as the most famous, most often repeated saying of Jesus, and probably for good reason. But here Jesus teaches us how not to judge. And at first, the teaching may seem straightforward and clear. But as we'll see, upon reflection, it is far more complex and far more difficult to practice than we might think. So here's what I'd like us to do today. I'd like us to consider three things as we turn to Matthew chapter 7. I want us to consider the context of judgment, the complexity of judgment, and the key to judgment. Context, complexity, key. So if you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 7. You'll find this passage printed on page 812 in the Pew Bible. You'll also uh, find it printed in your order of worship. I'll be reading Matthew 7 verses 1 through 6. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is God's word. It's trustworthy, and it's true, and it's given to us in love. Will you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that apart from you, these words would remain nothing more than letters on a page. And so we pray that by your grace, the same spirit that once inspired these words might illuminate them now for us so that your word might catch fire and burn within our hearts, leading us to a real encounter with Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, first, what's the context for judgment? Now, this would be easy to miss unless you pay attention. 
But in verses 3 through 5, and really throughout several sections in the Sermon on the Mount, notice how Jesus refers to a Christian. Jesus calls a fellow Christian a brother. Now you might think, thank you very much, that's obvious. But what are the implications of this? Well, you choose friends, you choose lovers, but you don't choose relatives. You choose your friends, you're given brothers and sisters. How do people become friends? A person says, well, I like you, you like me, we share common interests, let's do something together. Or how do people fall in love? They say, well, I'm attracted to you, I've got feelings for you, let's spend our life together. But you don't choose your brother or your sister, no, you're given your relatives. So friends and lovers, those are conditional relationships. You enter into a relationship with them precisely because of who they are. But that's not the way it works with relatives. Relatives are contra-conditional relationships. You enter into a relationship with them perhaps despite who they are. Now, I have very positive relationships with my siblings, and I have five of them, for which I'm very grateful, but that's not always the case. Sometimes we're in ra relationship with family members who we don't really like. You may like them, you may not, but it doesn't matter. You have obligations to them, regardless of who they are. And by calling a fellow Christian a brother, Jesus is saying, you need, you need this person in your life, whether you like it or not. Now, years ago, Tim Keller observed that C.S. Lewis drew out this point in a rather poignant scene in his novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Now, if you know the Narnia series, Aslan, the great lion, represents the Christ figure. And after his resurrection, he appears to two sisters, Susan and Lucy. And after they get over the shock of the fact that he's alive again, Aslan says, it's time to get down to business. We've got a mission. We've got work to do. And so this is how Lewis describes the scene. And now, said Aslan presently, to business. We have a long journey to go. You must ride on me. And he crouched down, and the children climbed onto his warm golden back. And Susan sat first, holding on tightly to his mane. And Lucy sat beyond, behind holding on tightly to Susan. And with a great heave, he rose underneath them and then shot off faster than any horse could go, downhill and into the thick of the forest. Now, it's very interesting how Lewis describes the Christian church post-resurrection and our relationships to Jesus and to one another. Now, if you know the story, you know that Susan is the older sister, and she's a little less certain. She's a little bit less trusting. She's a little more spiritually obtuse compared to her younger sister, Lucy. She doesn't always understand what Aslan is trying to do or what he's up to. And she, at times, can be a little cruel towards Lucy. But Lucy, the younger sister, is really the protagonist of the story. And she's, she's kind. She's, she's warm-hearted. She's open. She's got deep spiritual insight, more spiritual insight than, than any of her other siblings. And she shares a, 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 a special relationship with Aslan. And so Lewis puts Lucy on Aslan's back. But the only way that she can hold on to Aslan is if she holds on to Susan. The only way she can hold on to Aslan is if she holds on to Susan. You see, that is the Christian life. If you want to have a relationship with Jesus, if you want to be part of his mission, you can't do it on your own. You have to hold on to a Susan. You have to hold on to brothers and sisters. And, and what's so striking about this is that Lucy really is the most likable character in the novel. She's the one that we resonate with. She's the one that we identify with. She's the one that we want to become. And if anyone could enjoy a relationship with Aslan on her own, it'd be Lucy. She, she, could, she doesn't need other people. She's got it all. And yet, it doesn't work that way. There's no relationship with Jesus without relationship with brothers and sisters, including those that you may not especially like or the ones that you understand or the ones that you might have a hard time relating to. And that's why, that's why it's so easy for us to be judgmental towards them. It's so easy for us to be judgmental of the brothers and sisters that we have in Christ. But you see, what you real need to realize is that God doesn't make 
mistakes. So I want you to reflect on who are the Susans in your life. You may not have chosen them. You may not have chosen them as friends. You may not especially get along. You might find them difficult. But God has placed them in your life deliberately, intentionally, for a reason. And in fact, it may just be that the person you need most in your life and in your Christian journey is the person that drives you a little bit crazy. Because that's how the Christian life works. The only way you can hold on to Jesus and be part of his mission is by holding on to brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's one very good reason, especially at the start of a new year, why you should get involved in the community group or a Bible study or with the youth group. Because our community groups, our Bible studies, our, our youth group is not made up of natural friends that you necessarily might have chosen, but they are your brothers and sisters. You might not have anything in common with them in terms of your age, your stage of life, your ethnic background, your socioeconomic status. Perfect. That might be exactly what you need. You may never grow in your faith. You may never become the person that God has called you to be. You may never see what Jesus is trying to do in your life unless and until you hold on to a brother and a sister. The only way to hold on to Jesus is to hold on to whoever that Susan might be in your life. So it's in the context of our relationships with one another and within the wider world that Jesus offers this teaching on judgment. And on the one hand, he shows us in verse 1 that he has something to say about judgment. But on the other hand, at the end of the passage, in verse 6, he's got something to say about discernment, which reveals the complexity of judgment. This is not as simple and as straightforward as we might have thought. The, the question of judgment is complex. So let's see if we can put these two ideas together, judgment and discernment. So first of all, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then Jesus goes on to use this somewhat comical image of, of uh, someone approaching you. Let's, let, let's imagine someone is approaching you, and, and they're trying to get that speck out of your eye. But as they approach you, you see that they have a two-by-four piece of lumber sticking out of their own eye. Right? You wouldn't want that person getting anywhere near you. And yet that is what we often end up doing. What Jesus is trying to show us is that it's very easy for us to pinpoint the flaws in other people, and yet we are so blind. We're so blind to our own sins. And in some ways, we've lifted these words of Jesus up to become the 11th commandment of our culture. We love these words, judge not. I, I was reflecting on this this past week. I'm a child of the 80s and the 90s, right? I, I grew up in a time that was marked by moral relativism and easygoing tolerance. So the number one rule growing up was no matter what, you may never judge anybody for whatever their personal choices or proclivities may be. Now, on the one hand, that is still true of our culture today, but with a little bit of a twist. On the one hand, we're not supposed to judge any, anyone, and yet at the same time, we're living in a moment where we're experiencing ever-deepening cultural divides, especially over hot-button topics. And so at least when it comes to certain topics, we are supposed to stand up, choose a side, take a stand. And so in a way, at least when it comes to certain topics, that moralistic, relativistic culture is sort of shifting into a rather harsh, vindictive one. Because the more we publicly denounce wrongdoing, the more we signal our own virtue. And the more we show that we're on the right side of things. So do you see the, the complexity here? The, the, the question of judgment is far more complex than we might realize at first. We're not supposed to judge, and yet, on the other hand, we know deep down that if we never judge anything as wrong, then essentially we're turning a blind eye to evil and we're allowing injustice to run rampant. And this was David Galernter's concern. Do you know who David Galernter was? He was a computer science professor at Yale. And in June of 1993, he returns from a family vacation to his office 
and he opens up a package on his desk, and he's almost killed by the Unabomber. This package is a bomb, and it nearly blows off half of his right hand. And later, David Galerner writes a book. After the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, is tracked down by the FBI in 1996, Galerner realizes that our broader society treats the Unabomber something of a, as, as something of an intellectual curiosity. Believe it or not, People Magazine names him Ted Kaczynski, one of the most fascinating people <laughs> of 1996. And so Galerner writes a book because he's distressed. He's distressed by the, the moral myopia of our culture. And he traces the, the, the word judgmental, its use over time. And, and what he realizes is that prior to the 1960s, the word, the word judgmental was only used in a positive sense. To be judgmental meant that you exercised good judgment. You were a person who exercised good judgment. But after the 1960s, it was almost only used in a negative pejorative sense. But he begins to reflect on this and he realizes that, look, some kind of judgment is good and necessary. A, a, a society that is not judgmental in the positive sense is a society without justice. And we know that's right. I mean, we're, we're, we're celebrating Martin Luther King weekend. How could Dr. King have ever fought for racial justice unless he could cast a negative judgment on racism? Right? So the problem is more complex. So number one, Jesus says, judge not. He tells us that we're not supposed to judge, but then if you go to the end of the passage, verse 6, he says that we are supposed to be critical and discerning. So verse 6, he says, do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, this is a very difficult passage. Jesus is referring to some people as dogs and pigs. These are startling words coming from Jesus' mouth. That is not a compliment, right? So it shows that Jesus is not a pushover. He can call a spade a spade. And we can wrestle through what he means by this verse. But at a minimum, if he says, do not give dogs what is holy, do not cast your pearls before swine, well, he's telling us that at a minimum, we have to exercise discernment. We have to be discerning. We have to use our critical faculties to discern what is good and right and true and just, which means that at times we will need to make a negative judgment. And that's consistent with many other things that Jesus says later in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, beware of false prophets. Well, that means that you need to make a negative judgment. You need to discern, well, who is a false prophet? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, we're told, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And Jesus himself in John 7, verse 24 says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So there is a, a, a kind of judgment, a kind of discernment that we're meant to exercise. But what is he saying in verse 6? Let's just dwell on this for a moment. This is a famously difficult verse to interpret. The first thing we need to realize is that in context, when Jesus talks about dogs and pigs, he's not talking about cute, cuddly pets like the Shih Tzu that we keep at home. You know what our dog's name is? Snuggles. <laughs> snuggles. And she lives up to her name. She just crawls into your lap and snuggles with you all day long. Jesus is not talking about snuggles. He's talking about stray dogs. And when Jesus refers to pigs, he's not talking about friendly farm animals like Wilbur from Charlotte's Web. No, he's talking about wild pigs. So he's talking about stray dogs and wild pigs, both of which would be hungry, ravenous, and perhaps even dangerous. So people wouldn't give food from the temple to a stray dog, and you wouldn't sprinkle pearls in front of a wild pig. Well, why? Because what would happen? If a pig gobbled up pearls, that pig would quickly f find the pearls are tasteless, unappetizing, but worse than that, they would clamp down on that and find that those pearls are going to break their teeth and they're going to spit them out and then turn on you to attack you. Why? Well, if for no other reason, because you, unlike the pearls, are edible. So what is Jesus trying to get across here? Most commentators agree that the holy things, the pearls, are the gospel. 
the, the, the truth of God, the kingdom of God. Elsewhere, Jesus refers to the kingdom of God as a pearl of great price. But this is where most commentators get it wrong. I think almost everybody interprets this the wrong way. They say, well, if the holy things, the pearls, are the gospel, the truth about God, then what Jesus is saying is you have to be discerning, and you must not present the gospel to people who will not appreciate it. But none of us appreciates the gospel. Left to our own devices, left to ourselves, none of us appreciates the truth of God. That can't be what Jesus meant. If it was what Jesus meant, he didn't follow his own advice because Jesus freely offered the gospel, the truth of who God is, to people who didn't appreciate it. And what did they do? They turned on him and they ate him alive. So that can't be what Jesus means. Why do some people respond like dogs and pigs to the truth of God? Well, this whole passage the theme of this whole passage is that we have to start with ourselves before evaluating others. And so it may be that the problem is not just with them. The problem may also be with us. And I don't think anybody really interpreted this rightly except for perhaps Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran pastor in the early 1930s. And this is a somewhat extensive quote that I'm going to read to you, but he gets it just right. And so let this sink in. Bonhoeffer explains the vital difference, the vital difference between simply sharing the gospel, the truth of God, with the difference between that and trying to impose an ideology on people. He says, every attempt to impose the gospel by force, to use our own resources to arrange the salvation of other people is both futile and dangerous. It's futile because the swine do not recognize the pearls that are cast before them and dangerous because it profanes the word of forgiveness by causing those we fain would serve to sin against that which is holy. Worse still, we shall only meet with the blind rage of hardened and darkened hearts and that will be useless and harmful. Our easy trafficking with the word of cheap grace simply bores the world to disgust so that in the end it turns against those who try to force on it what it does not want. Thus a strict limit is placed upon the activities of the disciples, just as in Matthew 10 they're told to shake the dust off their feet where the word of peace is refused a hearing. Their restless energy, which refuses to recognize any limit to their activity, the zeal, which refuses to take note of any resistance, springs from a confusion of the gospel with a victorious ideology. An ideology requires fanatics who neither know nor notice opposition, and it is certainly a potent force. But the word of God, in its weakness, takes the risk of meeting the scorn of men and being rejected. There are hearts which are hardened and doors which are closed to the word. The word recognizes opposition when it meets it and is prepared to suffer it. It's a hard lesson, but a true one, that the gospel, unlike an ideology, reckons with impossibilities. The word is weaker than any ideology, and this means that with only the gospel at their command, the witnesses are weaker than the propagandists of an opinion. But although they are weak, they are ready to suffer with the word, and so are free from that morbid restlessness which is so characteristic of fanaticism. Now, I think Bonhoeffer was on to something. We live in a world that is marked by increasing fanaticism, propaganda, commitment to ideologies, which we impose upon other people. But that's not the gospel. That's not the way of the word. The word comes to us in weakness and is willing to suffer in order to win a hearing. So let's see if we can unravel this complexity. How are we supposed to put these two things together? Judgment and discernment, verse 1 and verse 6. Well, Jesus is not forbidding critical ability. He wants us to be able to discern what is good and right and true and just. So he's not forbidding the critical evaluation of others. What he's forbidding is the harsh condemnation of others. The problem is that when we do that, when we condemn others for the things that they've done, we forget our place. We forget our place in at least two senses. 
Number one, we forget that God alone is the judge. And number two, we forget that we are among the judged. See, first of all, we assume that we are God. Now, this verse is a little strange, isn't it? Judge not that you be not judged. That's an awkward phrasing. Why does Jesus put it that way? Well, you need to remember that in Jesus' day, people didn't say God's name. They avoided saying God's name. So that's why it's put in this passive tense. But what Jesus, in effect, is saying, judge not or you will be judged by God. Because he is the only one who has the right, the authority, the perspective, the wisdom to be able to judge the hearts of human beings. And that's the problem with judgment. You don't know another person's story. You don't know what they've been through, where they're coming from. You don't know what God is doing in their life right now. You can't see into their hearts. You don't know their motives. You don't know what they deserve. Only God knows that. And so when we sit on the judge's bench and we cast judgment down on others and condemn them for the things that they do, we're playing God. We're assuming a prerogative that belongs to God alone, but that's not all. We also forget that we are among the judged. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he goes on in verse 2 to say, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now again, he's using a passive voice here to avoid saying God's name. But in effect, it's the same. The standard you use to measure others will be the standard that God uses to measure you. And why is that? Because if you condemn somebody for something that they've done, then you are saying that you accept that standard as being right and correct. And if you agree with that standard, then you have to agree that it should be applied to you too. And I did, I did, <laughs> this is a hard passage to preach, by the way. Uh, I did some soul searching on this this week because I realized, oh, this is so convicting, is it not? If you ever condemn someone for something that they've done and say, you're a liar, you're giving God permission to judge you for every little white lie, every half-truth you've ever told. If you condemn someone and call them a cheat, then you're giving God permission to judge you for every little dalliance, every time you try to attract attention or every time you flirted with the wrong person. Or if you condemn someone and call them a thief, you're giving God permission to judge you for every time you've stolen your employer's time, every time you've taken something that didn't belong to you. I mean, is this not incredibly convicting? The measure you use to judge others will be the measure that God uses to judge you. So if that's the context of judgment, our relationships with one another in the wider world, and if that's the complexity of judgment, we have to tie together judgment and, and discernment. What's the key? How do we become critical and discerning without becoming harsh and condemning? Well, the key is that we have to realize what Jesus has done for us through the gospel. Jesus is the just judge who was judged in our place for what we deserve. When Jesus says, judge not, don't be judgmental, it's actually the same root for the word condemnation. That, that's the kind of judgment that he's forbidding, the judgment that condemns people, consigns them to hell forever because of what they've done. It's the same word. It's the same word that, that Paul uses in Romans 8, verse 1. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is not now, nor will there ever be any condemnation. Why? Because if you put your trust in Jesus, then there's no judgment, there's no condemnation, because he was condemned in our place. And if you take that truth into your heart, into your life, it will change you radically. And let me show a couple reasons why. Now, now, let me speak first of all to, to those who may not consider themselves Christians, or maybe you're not a Christian. The first thing you need to realize is that you can't process your questions, you can't process your doubts in isolation. It, it, if Lucy couldn't hold on to Aslan by herself, then none of us can. The only way to hold on to Jesus is if we hold on to brothers and sisters in Christ. 
We, we can't just have our own private religious experience. We, we, we can't just discover Jesus by reading books or listening to sermons. God doesn't work that way. He works through other people. So the first thing that we have to do is figure out, well, who are those Susans? Who, who are the brothers and sisters that we need to hold on to in order to grow in our faith, to discover who Jesus is and what it means to live the Christian life? But let me also address the Christian. I, I, if you are a Christian, you realize that Jesus is the just judge who is judged in our place. He was condemned so that there is no ultimate, final condemnation for us. Then that should make us both, both, both stronger and softer at the same time. It should make us both stronger and softer at one and the same time. See, first of all, that truth makes us stronger you realize that, that Jesus took wrongdoing, falsehood, sin, evil so seriously that he had to be judged in our place. There was no other way for us to be forgiven. And that strengthens you. That, that strengthens your resolve to discern what is good, what is true, what is right, what is just. So it strengthens you. But at the same time, knowing that Jesus is so gracious, so merciful, that he was willing to be judged in our place on the cross softens us. Because you realize that, that God doesn't save you, he doesn't accept you, he doesn't love you because you believe all the right things or because you do all the right things. You're not saved through good theology. You're saved by sheer grace. And that's the opposite of an ideology. You know, the more people are committed to an ideology or to a cause, the harsher they are with those with whom they disagree. But with Jesus, it's the opposite. The more you're committed to Jesus, the the kinder, the, the gentler, the more respectful you are with those with whom you disagree. You come through the weakness of the word and you're willing to suffer alongside of it. So, so the gospel both strengthens and softens us, which transforms us into people who speak the truth in love. We become people who speak the truth in love, and that's what we need to be. You know, some people are more truth people. You know, direct, confrontational, tell you like it is. Some people are more love people. Well, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be diplomatic. I'm going to beat around the bush a little bit. But, but both have their problems. And we're called to be both simultaneously. We're called to speak the truth in love. And why is that? Because truth without love is not really truth. It becomes hard. It becomes brittle. You, you, you think that you're just being direct, but, but really you're often cruel. You're unfeeling. You, you're, you're condemning people. You're, you're writing people off because they're not doing things your way or in the order that you think they should. What you're doing is throwing pearls before pigs. You're not simply offering the gospel. No, you're imposing an ideology, an ideology of your own. So truth without love is not really truth. It, it becomes hard. And love without truth is not really love. It, it becomes soft. You, you think you're just being kind and diplomatic, but you know what you really are? You're a wimp. It's just cowardice. You're, 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 you're afraid to confront. You're, confraid, you're afraid to challenge. You're, you're, you're afraid to, 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 to tell somebody that they might be wrong about something. And why is that? It, it's not because you love them. It's because you love yourself. You don't want to offend. You don't want to disrupt. But it, it, it's really because you love yourself and, and you're so afraid of, of losing their acceptance or lo losing their approval. And so you don't tell them the thing that they most need to hear. That's not loving. So truth without love is not really truth. And love without truth is not really love. But together, soft and strong, we become people who speak the truth in love when we take the message of the cross deep into our heart and into our life. And that is what the world most needs right now. People who possess profound clarity and yet demonstrate deep compassion. Profound clarity and deep compassion. That's what the world needs. Notice verse 5. Jesus doesn't say we should never correct a brother or a sister. No, he, he assumes that we will. We should. We should correct a brother or a sister, but only after, only after we've dealt with our own issues first. So this principle applies both to our personal relationships as well as our, our public debates. We're not supposed to turn to a blind eye to, to wrongdoing. We're supposed to do something about it. But how do you get the speck out of somebody else's eye? Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to, to help 
get a piece of dust or, or maybe an eyelash out of somebody else's eye. That requires gentleness. That, that requires great care and, and sensitivity. And if you're going to try, you better make sure that you can see clearly. And that's the genius of Jesus' image here. Our shortcomings, our failures, whether it's a speck or a two-by-four sticking out of our log, regardless, it should seem larger and more serious to us because it's ours. It's right there, <laughs> right in our own eye. But that's not how we generally work. We usually exaggerate the faults of others and minimize our own. But it's got to be the opposite. Rather than trivializing our own sins, we have to see them as more significant, more serious than the faults of others because they're ours. But if we deal with them first, if we address them first through the grace of the gospel, well, then we become people who can speak the truth in love because we have been both strengthened and softened by the just judge who is judged in our place by sheer grace. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would help us to wrestle with this question of judgment. We acknowledge the context in which it arises through our relationships with one another and help us to see afresh how vital our relationships with one another are to our spiritual growth and development. There is no holding on to Jesus without holding on to one another. So help us to see the brothers and the sisters that we need to cling to in our life right now. But help us, Father, to avoid falling into the trap of harsh condemnation. Teach us to be wise and discerning without becoming harsh and condemning. And the way in which we do that is by receiving anew the amazing message of what Christ has done for us freely through his cross. It's not an ideology that we impose upon others, but rather it is a message of good news that we receive even in weakness and suffering. So help us to receive that word as our own and be transformed by it. We pray in Jesus' name.